need to stop burning fuel for power generation. ABR now uh, uh, runs the, the, the NASA space station. How big is the competition on a license and market? I think it's also important to have to, for, for a balance, the gender balance. So we are constantly looking at uh, collaborating with uh, technology suppliers. And what is the perfect timing for licensing? Now. Okay, so today we are here in Budapest filming with Gary Godwin from KBR Company. Hello Gary, mm. nice meeting you here. Hello Regina, it's nice to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for coming. So, we can start with our business part, discussing the main oil and gas industry challenges. Could you please tell me what is your opinion about it? Which are the main? Yeah, I, th I think now the, uh, the industry is in a, uh, an environmental challenge. I think uh, public perception of the hydrocarbons industry, uh, CO2 generation, greenhouse gases, uh, environmental warming is, uh, is, a, is, is, is a significant aspect of, of, of what our industry faces now. Okay, so you say environmental question is the main of nowadays challenges and could you name others, which is also important? Yeah, I think that uh, in, the, uh, in the, the developed world um, we have uh, challenges on, on overall product demand. Product demand for, for transportation fuels uh, is relatively flat, um, but we do have a, an ever-increasing demand for, for petrochemicals. Okay. Um, in, the de in, the, in the developing world, uh, there's still those challenges of capacity increases, new units, uh, increasing scalability, and ever-increasing public demand for, uh, for transportation fuels as well as, uh, as, as well as petrochemicals. Okay, and can you name me one challenge which is, according to you, is the most profitable and beneficial for your company? Only one. I think our syn gas business, our ammonia business, has been uh, the bedrock of KBR's uh, technology business over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, it continues to be an important part of our business, but as we've grown our technologies, um, it's become uh, more balanced within the, uh, the portfolio that we, that we have now. Um, so our olefins business is becoming a lot more significant. I'm interested. For example, the challenges, they come and go. Am I right? And you're developing some new technologies according to these challenges. When the challenge has passed, what happens to that technologies? Well, I think that those uh, challenges um, continue to occur. Um, they occur in, uh, in parts of the world at different times. So you look over the last 20 or 30 years, the changes in specification of gasoline, of diesel, has occurred. It started out in the West, uh, in Europe, in, in North America. And that challenge of specifications in transportation fuel has continued to, to change throughout the world. So I'm not sure whether there are any challenges that have been solved completely, and hence our technology is is no longer utilized. I think our technologies evolve and develop and transform themselves over that period of time. So uh, an ammonia unit of 30 years ago that maybe a world scale unit would be a thousand metric tons per day, uh, KBR is now looking at ammonia plants of 6,000 tons per day. So economies of scale, demand growth, mm -hmm. Uh, it means that, that those technologies evolve to meet, to meet different challenges, I'd say, Regina. And Gary, how many years can one technology live? Oh, for ammonia, it's been, uh, well, I mean, refining has been, uh, has been around for, for 100 years. Uh, 
you know, we are, we are still designing and building crude distillation units. Um, we are evolving technologies, uh, for example, alkylation, uh, which is the production of, uh, of high octane gasoline blending components that started in the 1940s um, using hydrofluoric acid and, and KBR is now uh, commercializing solid catalysts. So the process changes and evolves even over the last uh, 50, 70 years. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting for me. If a client buy these technologies, for example, 30 years ago, he bought it. And what happened now? Does he start to, I don't yeah. know, develop it further? Yeah, ab absolutely. We, are, we, we see uh, a large demand for the, the revamping, for the rejuvenation of, of old, old plants, old equipment, uh, replacement of furnaces, replacement of compressors. Uh, and rather than just um, the client wanting to uh, just replace like for like, they obviously want uh, added value to that investment. So we're seeing a lot of uh, revamps of, of refining, uh, of ammonia plants. Um, we're seeing those uh, in clients wanting an increase in capacity. They want a significant reduction in energy efficiency. Uh, and they want more reliable plants. So a lot of KBR's technology's focus has been around uh, improvements of those existing assets. I think asset optimization, the provision of technical services to those existing assets as they mature is, is a really important part of a licensor's business. How do you find out? that it is your destiny. How Give a piece of advice for young people, how to feel this and how to find it. I think you, I think you have to have an, an interest in solving problems, uh, feeling as though you can uh, develop uh, your knowledge and skills to, to solve problems, um, to create new ideas. Um, I think you have to have a, an interest in, in maths. And I think you have to be pretty good with numbers and then I think also there's a bit of uh, gut feel so yeah you can you can teach and train people I think uh, you know as our industry develops and, and all the pressure and the environmental pressure on it recruitment and retention of those engineers is going to be a real challenge for us in the future a, a real challenge and we've got to be able to make our industry open and uh, and interesting to to those people that are maybe engineering orientated and i think it's also important to have to for, for a balance the gender balance as well uh 40 percent of my my group in london are, are women um and i think that that creates a very different environment um we're a far more balanced environment and a far more you know an opens to idea type environment as well You know, on your website, I found a phrase, we help business all over the world to transform their feedstocks into high value petrochemical products. Am I right that the thing you are talking about right now is a part of this particular strategy? Yes, yes, it is. I mean, that, that conversion to, to high value petrochemical feedstocks is probably more is, is associated with the development of our olefins technologies. Uh, KBR has a long history of ethylene cracking technologies of the traditional furnace technologies uh, that produces a lot of ethylene relative to propylene and, and as you well know the demand for propylene continues to to grow uh, probably two times the the level of, of ethylene demand so what kbr has done is is we have uh, developed um, mm. a kcot technology an olefins technology that has naphtha at the basis of its feedstock. It uses our traditional uh, fluidized catalytic cracking, our FCC orthoflow uh, technology. And we've tailored that into a completely new process, which uh, produces significantly more propylene um, to versus, uh, versus ethylene. In fact, it produces a one-to-one -one ratio of propylene to ethylene 
meeting the client's needs for additional propylene out of naphtha feedstocks relative to, to the, the ethylene that they require. So that's a complete change and uh, evolution. Okay, and le let's choose some last technology, last develop, and mm. just give us approximate understanding, approximate numbers, how much it costs for you to develop this and launch it. Total costs is, is difficult to say, but, but historically R&D in the licensing industry has, uh, has been anywhere between five to seven percent of revenue as, mm -hmm. a, uh, as a means of plowing that, that investment back into development of new technologies. Well, and does every technology pay off itself? No, I'm sure that, no, there are, there are uh, several failures, uh, I'm sure, in the, in the industry. Um, technologies that have sat on the shelf, never been commercialized. Uh, I mean, it's a risky business taking a, a completely new technology and commercializing that technology for the first time, having that trust in, uh, in the licensor that their R&D, that their engineering capabilities, the due diligence that's been completed as part of uh, development of this new technology is sufficient to allow that investment to occur. I mean, a lot of the risk associated with commercialization of new technology, that risk is on the operator. Uh, licensors are, it's very difficult for a licensor to, um, to uh, compromise that, that investment. It's very difficult for a licensor to, uh, um, to financially compensate uh, if the technology does, uh, does not work. Can you give me an example of the technology which was not a success? No, no. No. Every technology of KVI is success. I mean, those, some of those technologies probably sit uh, way, way in the background of our portfolio. That, that uh, We had technologies that, that have been sitting there for 20 or 30 years that, that have not been uh, developed. But, but even recently, we have a technology called... Uh, Regen Max, which we put a uh, we put a um, a, a structured uh, uh, system into the regenerator of a fluidized catalytic cracker. That system reduces the the emissions levels coming out of the uh, the flue gas. Um, that technology was was jointly developed, uh, yeah, as I said, twenty years ago, and and only over the last two to three years has it been commercialized. Uh, due to environmental regulations and specifications. How much time it takes from the research to commercialization of technology? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I think that um, it's a long time. It typically, a typical refinery project, um, even, even with uh, um, commercialized, experienced technology, takes anywhere between four to six years to develop so the commercialization of new technology is uh, you know the R&D takes at least one one to three years the catalyst development the engineering design so generally you know you could be looking at uh, at close to 10 years to commercialize new technologies um, it, it, our KSAP technology that we have commercialized, the acid alkylation technology, uh, we've commercialized in China. We're now licensing that in the United States. That is probably, that probably was very fast. It took us probably about four to five years to commercialize That's this fast. technology. That's really fast. And I think the, certainly in Asia and specifically in China, their growth and their demand for, for these new technologies, their appetite to, to take risks is, uh, is higher than, than, than maybe the Western world. Can this four or five years experience happen in Europe? Yeah, I think the European refining industry, uh, given the margins, given the decline, the number of closures that have occurred, the, the, the risk, uh, the appetite for risk uh, is 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 lower than than, than that of uh, that of the, that of other other countries, specifically China. There are tremendous technologies that are being developed in Europe. 
especially uh, we talked earlier on about the environmental side of uh, of uh, our industry and the need to to recycle plastics so uh, you know the likes of of mol uh, omv they're they're all developing technologies to be able to to recycle plastics um, so some so those risks where they see uh, both a, a geopolitical requirement a business requirement they're prepared to take on the risk of research and development uh, commercialization themselves we're speaking a lot about your developments and a question occurred to me how big is the competition on a licensor market yeah it's uh, it's it's very strong you you would always in in most projects always expect to see two to three licensors actively pursuing the same project even if it's a small revamp uh, of a hydro treater right the way through to a grassroots um, olefins complex or polyolefins complex there's always at least three licensors bidding for, for, for that competition it makes the licensors job uh, um, extremely challenging but for the, from the client's perspective I think that, that there's a real advantage they, they create a competitive environment Technologies continue need to need to be developed and uh, and updated in order to uh, um, to in order to compete competitively. So yes, it's a, a very challenging environment, and I'm sure in your conferences you see uh, you see that competition from from many aspects. Speaking about our congress recently, we were also interviewing um, Dan Gillis from Chevron Lumos Global. He was also a participant for this Petrochemical and Refining Congress in Budapest. And he told that Chevron Lumos Global doing a lot to, to take all the advantages and to, to be in one line with industry challenges. And that's uh, their competitive advantage. And what is yours? So what advantages can, can KBR show to a client and to the market? Yeah. I, uh, well, first of all, I, I, I know Dan very well. We were we were colleagues for for many many years when I when I worked uh, when I worked in in Chicago with with him uh, in the same in the same company for a previous employee. Probably most importantly, we we able we were able to uh, to um, as a single point of contact, we were able to take a project right the way from uh, conceptual development all the way through to uh, to execution and commissioning of the of the project uh, leveraging both our, our technical heritage our technology licensing heritage as well as our uh, EPC heritage so we can do feasibility studies we can do basic engineering design we can take a project to to front-end engineering design and we can do any necessary detailed engineering design Let's move further to your hobbies. Oh, I know that cycling is your favorite. Yeah. Why? Yeah. I, I just have a, a real passion. Uh, first of all, I think, you know, in the business that we're in, there's a huge amount of, of travel uh, across the regions um, to the United States on a very regular basis. It's a very hectic business life. And, and what cycling uh, does is, is switch off. Uh, I can get on my bike and, and, and for the first hour I'm still thinking about business but after that first hour the focus is on, on riding the bike and, uh, and interacting with, with new friends. I, uh, cycling uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm part of a club, you're able to uh, interact with a whole host of people that you may not have, uh, have met across your normal professional and, and, and social life. So I enjoy the, the physical exercise um, as well as the uh, as, as well as the social side, and there is a technology element to it as well. You know, the bikes are are very technical, very lightweight, using a lot of special metals, carbon fiber frames. So there's the kind of engineering geeky side of uh, of cycling that uh, that as an engineer I I also enjoy as well. While managing your London Technology Centre, 
which technologies are the most popular among your clients? So the, uh, the presentation that I gave at, uh, at the Congress uh, over the last two days KBR's ROSE technology, a Residuum Oil uh, Solvent Extraction technology, that has seen a, a significant uh, mm. level of increase in, in demand over the last uh, three to five years. Um, so the, the, the IMO regulations that are now coming in in January of uh, 2020 has seen European refiners significantly increase the amount of uh, fuel oil destruction that they are wanting to do. And, and ROSE is, is a key differentiator, both in terms of capital cost, uh, energy utilization, and overall efficiency of extraction of, of effectively um, vacuum gas oil type material in order to be able to uh, upgrade that to transportation fuels. What is the benefit of, for example, these ROSE technology in the long term for a client and for environment? I think the world overall needs to get away from burning hydrocarbons as fuel. Um, so the first thing that, that really needs to be done is that, uh, as, you, as you see from the IMO regulations, bunker fuel for shipping is, is now becoming more of a transportation fuel rather than, you know, with the 0.5 weight percent sulfur specification, and I'm sure more will come, rather than it being just a fuel oil, the, the bottom of the barrel, it's now becoming a, a higher quality specification fuel. So what we need to do is, in, in the world is we need to stop burning fuel for power generation. And we need to start utilizing crude oil uh, for, for, for higher value products. And predominantly in the end, we will be using crude oil for petrochemicals production. Um, so I think that, uh, that these technologies, and particularly ROSE uh, is an enabler to, to, to go down that path of, of reducing the amount of fuel oil that uh, we as a, as a society continue to burn. So what is the economic side of this technology to a client? They're expensive projects and the return on those projects under current market prices is, um, you know, is, is, is five plus years. So they're, they're, they're significant decisions. How much time they need to take such decision? Uh, I, I think that that depends very much on the, uh, on, the, on the client. Some, as we talked about earlier, some, some in, in Asia can, can take very quick decisions. Others uh, take years and years and, and come back and revisit those projects. I mean, I've been in the industry over 30 years and, and sometimes mm. uh, you dust off the shelf a project that was looked at 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and it's being re-looked at again. So, so these time scales and the economics and the financing, financing is a, is a critical aspect of, of ensuring that uh, projects are developed. They all take very, very long periods of time um, and are very, very client and regional, uh, regional specific. Yeah. Okay, and what is a perfect timing for licensing? Now. Now. <laughs> yes. So now. you're ready just uh, we, now. We are ready. You, yeah, you, we are ready to, really? uh, to, 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 to license and support any, any projects that, uh, that, that, that clients want to, want to develop. So I also saw that um, KBR has a business transformation project announced from 2014. And how many projects was launched after this for this business transformation? Yeah, KBR as a, as a company has, uh, has changed uh, significantly since uh, Stuart Brady, our, our CEO, um, arrived in, in 2014. Uh, we sold off a lot of our uh, nuclear businesses, our power businesses, our building construction businesses. We focused on, on three core areas, uh, KBR technology being one of them. Uh, our EPC, traditional EPC business, uh, in terms of our hydrocarbon services, uh, continues to be a, an important area. But we're focusing that, that business uh, predominantly uh, around upstream production, uh, leveraging our knowledge in, in LNG um, to be able to, uh, to provide you know, large-scale efficient operations. Um, and one area that KBR has really developed itself in 
is, is our government services business. Um, KBR now were, uh, runs the, the, the NASA space station. Uh, we run mission control there. I think we're probably the fourth largest space company in, in the United States now. We do a lot of uh, high-tech development in, in, that, uh, in that space arena, as well as defense systems. So the whole business transformation uh, has been quite significant. We've, we've just rebranded KBR, we've redefined the category that we're in uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an IT category rather than as, a, as an oil and gas company just because of the solutions and the diversification of the solutions that we're, we're pri providing. So I, I think KBR is now a solutions provider um, rather than maybe the, the legacy uh, um, construction company, uh, service support company that, uh, that we, we historically were. I know that you had a great experience working in India. Could you please uh, share your impressions about the India and the country? Yeah, I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, to head as general manager of UOP India between uh, 2006 and, and 2010. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, running a, a UOP uh, petrochemicals business in Italy. Um, and it was very interesting, as well as actually uh, establishing a, and growing a, a huge business for, for UOP uh, in that period of time. We took the business from 35 people in, uh, in India to, to 260 uh, and running a $170 million business. And it was the kind of golden age of refining, as we like to speak, you know, 2008 and that period of time where the growth of, of Indian refining was significant. We, the new Jamnagar refinery, the, the growth of the uh, refineries that uh, IOCL had. The experiences whilst I was there were from both a business as, as well as a personal perspective because I, I took my family there with me as well. So I had two very young children at the time. Uh, my, my daughter was only four and my son was, uh, was eight when they arrived in India. Um, but not the first time for me being in India. In fact, I, I met my wife in India whilst we were really? both at university in the UK. Uh, we met in, uh, in Kerala. Wow. Um, so uh, India has a, a long history with us, going, uh, going way before we, uh, we moved there to, uh, for me to, to work. So do you miss those days? Yes, I do. I, I miss the, uh, the growth um, this huge growth that I, I don't think that we will see in, in refining and petrochemicals probably ever again. Um, the challenges of deciding what project we were going to be working on next. Um, the, the, the recruitment, the development of young engineers through, uh, through the training programs, seeing those people uh, grow over the last uh, 15 years. Um, yeah, I miss, miss those days, but also looking forward now, taking on that experience and knowledge. I was in my, my early 40s when I, when I became the general manager of, uh, of UOP in India. So taking on those, those challenges now and applying them to, uh, to the environment that, that I'm, I'm currently working on, heading uh, KBR across EMEA. Since we are doing the events and the Congress, so Pierce Europe just finished yesterday, yeah. I want to ask you about how do you estimate Congresses and events for your business? I was fortunate enough to attend uh, your Congress in, uh, in Berlin last year. Um, I think you, you mentioned that there were something like 200 people uh, at that event. I'm, I'm really impressed with the level of, uh, of operators, of clients, as we would call them, uh, refineries, petrochemical companies, the, the involvement that they have in, in this event. So I can see five, six, maybe even ten critical clients uh, all in one, one area, in one event in, within the space of two days. Um, this year, I think you've taken a, a significant step uh, in, in increasing not only the representation from refiners, 
um, and petrochemical producers, but just the overall size of the of the Congress and the number of delegations rising to, I understand, over 400. And you can tell that uh, that there's been a step change in the uh, in the level of, of attendance and discussions and the, the quality of the presentations as well. I think the quality of the presentations is excellent. It's provided tremendous insights into the direction that our industry and the challenges that our industry faces. Um, and you've had a, a number of, of very, very interesting delegates and more, more so than just uh, European delegates, you know. I, uh, people, you know, refiners from Brazil, Russians, you've had Chinese, Sinopec coming here to present as well, uh, do, doing excellent presentations. So you've really, you've kept it as, a, as an kind of an Eastern European um, uh, uh, center, but brought in a, a, number of, uh, a number of different delegates of, of very senior levels as well, which is uh, always very helpful for, for us as, uh, as, as senior managers talking uh, within the industry because we think you know it's important so Europe has its own region but Europe should see what other regions are doing that's why we're still focusing on Europe but bringing as you said more clients and participants from the other regions and you know what I want to know uh, what goal do you set to yourself when you come to the Paris when you came to PRC uh, yesterday yeah. and the day before my, my goal is to, to learn to, to, to listen to, uh, to, 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 to mainly refiners and operators, to understand really what their, their challenges are, um, such that I can take that back into KBR and, and try and uh, understand what solutions we need to, to provide. I mean, business is, is absolutely critical. So even at this event, I've, I've seen some, some clients and had very, very important discussions around current projects that we're working on and, and as importantly, new projects that are, that are being, being developed. So uh, I have a goal of, uh, of interacting with, with key critical clients here, um, and also to be able to uh, provide information. So, so the presentation that we gave this year on, uh, on our, our ROSE technology uh, and lined up with, with a number of other licensors looking at residue conversion to disseminate that information, to create a debate and a discussion around the challenges that we face and the solutions that we can provide, I think is, is really important as well. So they were, I guess, the main three goals that I had in, in coming here. And I must say that they were all achieved and, uh, and surpassed. That's a pleasure for me to hear. And also, I wanted to ask Gary, after participating in such event. Have you ever had an experience to get a projects and contracts out of these new business connections or maybe refreshing old connections? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're occurring on a, on a very regular, regular basis. We, uh, one of our very large projects that, uh, that we've just completed engineering design on came out of uh, a presentation, a uh, presentation I gave last year on on VCC, on our vapor combi cracking technology, really, we uh, we we licensed a, a new unit um, and and completed the engineering on on a on a new VCC technology. So so yeah, conferences are really important to meet clients, be able to discuss, and even at this conference this this week, we uh, we learned of um, of some some major increases in petrochemical production from. Eastern European clients, um, not just one technology, but maybe two or three technologies that, that KBR is a, is a world leader in that we can, uh, we can use here. So you want to meet client and do you want to find maybe a new supplier or subcontractor or um, another company with whom you want to make a partnership? Is it also your goal at the Congress? Yes, it is. We are constantly looking at uh, collaborating with uh, technology suppliers, with equipment suppliers. What a supplying company should tell or show you at the Congress in order to catch your interest and your attention? Uh, they probably need to show, demonstrate to us a, uh, a commercial a viability, um, a, a differentiator, uh, create the value proposition, 
as to how this technology or how this item of equipment can be integrated into, uh, into KBR's technology. I think it's always important to, to provide some economic analysis around, uh, around the provision of, of new equipment or new technology, uh, defining it as a, as a market trend, what's happening, how it's going to solve a, a new market trend, um, and be enthusiastic about, uh, about their technology and believe that their technology can, uh, can be integrated to, 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 to solve, solve problems. Well, I'm sure that during these two days you were invited for VIP meetings, mm -hmm. which my team is organizing every day at the Congress. Were there any um, interesting suppliers who proposed and presented their experience to you in a proper way? Yeah, I, I, I really, uh, I really like the uh, the Sinopec presentation, looking at uh, removal of, uh, of of ethylene from FCC off gases. And the commercialization that they have uh, they have demonstrated, particularly in China, and how those can be integrated into uh, into new petrochemical complexes. I, I think that that is really worth looking at, and I, I'm going to take that back. Um, I like the uh, the ceramic uh, tube coatings uh, that 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 were uh, were being proposed here as well. I think that any levels of energy efficiency. Um, and the commercialization of that can can be uh, can be given added effects, and also uh, those VIP meetings enabled us to uh, to meet with our clients and to learn about new projects and new opportunities that uh, that we have to uh, to license new technology. So, yeah, a very effective way of uh, of being able to uh, to spend two days. You don't get to meet four or five clients, uh, critical clients in the space of two days, um, you know, where you're actually doing business on a, uh, on a, on a, on a, on a normal day to day basis. That's our main goal. And yeah. I'm happy to hear that we achieved it with you. So we are moving to another traditional part, which is blitz. Are you ready for that? Uh, I think I'm ready. Best vacation is? My best vacation is uh, time with my family in uh, in Tuscany in Italy, uh, overlooking uh, sit living or staying in a in a hilltop town, uh, overlooking uh, beautiful rolling countryside with uh, with the sun setting. Perfect. Uh, do you like taking risks? I like to think I'm a risk taker. I think I uh, I I take calculated risks. Have you ever given up with your creative ideas because you were worried about what others would think about your idea? Yeah, I think as uh, as an engineer, I think we're always worried about about what others what others think. I wouldn't say that I'm uh, particularly entrepreneurial. Otherwise, maybe I'd be be running my my own business, but. Uh, I think when I when I believe that there's a, a new technology and a new advancement, then then I, I go with that. We we certainly in, in a previous company, we developed uh, the recycling of, of PET, uh, polyethylene terephthalate, the uh, the plastic bottles. We developed that um, over 15 years ago, and I really believed in that and believe that we could uh, could achieve something new, and, and and we did. Okay, and if you run your own company, what would it be? I think I'd like to run a restaurant. I, uh, I, I enjoy cooking. I probably wouldn't be particularly... I enjoy cooking. I enjoy uh, uh, varieties of wines. So, um, yeah, I, if, if I had a completely different career change, I'd, I'd like, to, like to run a nice restaurant. Great. Do you easily say no? Sometimes I probably say no too quickly and then think about it. But I, I am prepared to, to change my mind if I, I, if, 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 uh, I try to create a, 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 an openness in, open environment in order for that people can feel as though they can, can challenge me, certainly in a, in, a, in a business environment. Okay. And if you had the opportunity to stay forever at some age, what age? Oh, I think between uh, 30 and 35. Why? Uh, I think uh, you've got... You've still got your youth, uh, and by that time, you should have been able to to be in a job to have enough money. 
but then maybe not the responsibilities that uh, that come later. What kind of music do you like? Ah, I've I've always been a big fan of uh, of dance music, of uh, electronic uh, techno music, um, and in fact, recently. Uh, uh, I took my son to, to Miami to a, he's 21, took him to a, uh, a music dance festival and we spent three days together and three nights uh, dancing away. So if I would look at one genre of music, then I, I think it would still be electronic dance music. Gary, whom do you want to pass this interview? I would uh, like to pass this interview over to uh, Zia Gurin. Zia is the uh, technical director for, for Chupras. Uh, Chupras is a Turkish refinery. Uh, they actually operate four refineries. You can talk to him about uh, uh, Chupras's uh, strategic plans, the development of their, uh, their refineries, uh, the projects that they have already uh, instigated and uh, on behalf of KBR you can ask him uh, will he license a rose unit okay <laughs> <laughs> good good yeah I think you'd find him uh, a very very interesting individual to speak to and I know you you already know him as well Regina yes it's my old client and friend yeah.